Tonight on a special Revolt Black News Weekly, investigating Black Lives Matter, the true color story. You have lost someone very close to you and your family. One of my cousins texted me and said, do you remember Keenan?" I said, yes. She said he died. Please, please, please. You tried his George for me. I'm gonna tell you something. Patrice Cullors back in the activism spotlight after police brutality hits close to home. I was prepared for this to happen to one of my family members. And that may sound really morbid, but black people understand. The emotional interview detailing her life in the spotlight as she addresses the Black Lives Matter financial controversy and the question everyone is asking, where is the money? I'm just gonna ask you directly, have you ever used BLM money to buy real estate? The mistakes, the solutions, and combating the nationwide problem of brutality by those in blue, from Los Angeles to more recently, Memphis, Tennessee. No black person ever thinks that they are going to die at the hands of the police, but we all prepare to die at the hands of police. Our no-holds-barred interview with nothing off the table. Tonight, the true color story on Revolt Black News Weekly. everyone and welcome to the show. I'm Mara Escampo and we begin tonight with our investigation of Black Lives Matters, the true color story. Did you know that the entire Black Lives Matter movement was started with one hashtag? Well, Patrice Cullors is the woman who first posted those words, unknowingly launching one of the biggest social justice movements in U.S. history. Today, when many people think about the BLM co-founder, they think about accusations that she used BLM money as a personal piggy bank. So is any of that true? Well, we asked. She opened up to us about those accusations and more, including her mental health struggles, contemplating suicide, and learning that one of her own family members, 31-year-old Keenan Anderson, died after an encounter with Los Angeles police. Patrice Cullors was a 30-year-old local activist when she first used the hashtag Black Lives Matter in the moments after Trayvon Martin's killer was found not guilty in 2013. Not guilty. Shot and killed an unarmed 17-year-old. From that one simple post, a whole movement was born, rising up against the frequent killing of unarmed black people and transforming Patrice into a national figure. Now, after stepping back from social media and public appearances for more than a year, the Black Lives Matter co-founder is back, once again fighting against police violence. But this time, it's very personal. You have lost someone very close to you and your family. How did you learn about Kenan's death? On January 5th, one of my cousins texted me and said, do you remember Kenan? I said, yes. <laughs> and she said he died. On January 6th, another cousin texted me, uh, cousin, the police killed Keenan. This is 31-year-old Keenan Anderson, Patrice's cousin. The Washington, D.C.-based high school English teacher and father was visiting L.A. when he got into a car accident on January 3rd. That's when the cops showed up. Edited body cam footage released by the LAPD shows things quickly spiraling out of control. Hey, stop right there! Yeah. You tried his for me. Please don't According do to the LAPD, Please. Anderson was tased six times in 42 seconds, even though he was already being restrained by several officers and begging for help. Oh, stop it! Oh, Anderson died several hours later at the hospital. His cause of death has not been established. And now the corner of Lincoln and Venice, where the accident happened, is a memorial site. Have you seen the LAPD's video, the body cam video? I have seen the video of my, my cousin's tasing. Please, please, please. I, I'm gonna tase him, I'm gonna tase him. I saw it before the public. Um, many of us did, um, many of the family members. 
went up to LAPD police station and watched the video. So they invited the family to come look at the, at the video. What did you think when you saw that video? A couple things. I've obviously I've spent the last decade responding to, you know, whether it's body cam footage or people's um, iPhone footage or, but I purposefully don't watch the videos. Why? Because in some ways I have to be a little bit removed so I can be there for the families. I have purposefully to protect my peace and to be, be available. I just don't sit and watch the videos. But this video I needed to see. I needed to come up with my own conclusions. I needed to kind of like, you know, I knew our family would watch it, so I wanted to be able to be in conversation about it. Please, sir, I didn't mean to, sir, please. Hold on, hold on, please. okay? I think the thing that was so painfully disturbing about witnessing that video is how often he begged for help. Watch out. Help! Help! Please, 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 please. Even hearing him be like, I don't, I want, I want to be seen. Oh, here. Everybody got to see me, sir. Have a seat I don't want to be in the black. Over here. I want people to see me. Sir, okay, you can please, sit right there then. He wasn't running away from the cop. He was trying to have people see him so that there would be witnesses. So you think that's why he darted Absolutely. into the street? Please. Come here. Please. Please. Come here. He had just gotten into a car accident. So if you've ever been in a car accident, you're pretty shook. Your, 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 your emotions are high. You're trying to make sense of what's happening. And my cousin looked confused. He looked concerned and he also verbally was begging for help. And I think hearing him and then watching the escalation from LAPD <clears throat> was really, really triggering and super traumatizing. You mentioned that he seemed confused. Sit with your legs please, crossed. They're gonna try to kill me, please. Who's trying to kill you? I, I, I had a stunt today. What? I had a stunt today, sir. You had, I need to. you had what? A stunt. Like, no, 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 no. There have been questions about his mental state, at least in that moment. Did he suffer from mental illness? I don't know um, about my cousin's mental health history, but what I do know is that in that moment, he asked for help. Like, that's what I know. And the fact that he didn't receive it is probably the most, the gravest injustice because if he received actual help, I believe wholeheartedly that my cousin would be alive today. I hate this next question, but the reason <laughs> that I'm gonna ask it is because it's constant in comments when videos like this are posted. How do you respond to people who say that this is the victim's fault because they just wouldn't comply? Um, I really wanna challenge that. It's a conversation that we need to be having because for a long time, uh, and it still happens, but we had a whole movement called Me Too where people blamed rape victims uh, for their own rape. If they just had different clothes on, if they just didn't go to that hotel room, um, why is this any different? Why is it that an interaction with law enforcement ends to violence and death? Uh, why isn't it actually Keenan should be alive? Um, I really want to challenge that for people. Um, because there are so many times where people did comply and they still died. And um, I, I believe my cousin was complying. You've been on the other side of this. With other families, With yeah. other families countless times. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you now to be in it with your own family? Surreal. In some ways, I was prepared for this to happen to one of my family members. And that may sound really morbid, but Black people understand. You felt emotionally that you had been preparing in some way. No, it's never, it, I, I felt like strategically, emotionally nothing prepares you mm. for something like this. But I knew what to do. I knew we needed to tell the media. I knew that the minute I put it on Instagram that people would listen. You mentioned some of the ways that the media had described him. Yes. Suspect, behaving erratically, yeah. which to you were such familiar buzzwords. 
tell us who Keenan really was. Not all of those media buzzwords, but who was your cousin? Like a really big motivator. He was a mentor. Um, like, you know, I really love how people are saying school teacher because he was, but like he was much more than a school teacher. He didn't just check in and check out. He really believed in his students. Very thoughtful, really funny, big smile. We have, we, you know, we have come from a big smiling family. He was a father, and um, he was he had a fiance. I just remember my you know, early memories um, going to family gatherings. We used to do a lot of like family picnics and family gatherings and him just having like a big smile on his face. Your family is now planning a funeral. You have said that you might like to have an independent autopsy and that perhaps you would have Colin Kaepernick pay for it as part of the initiative that he started to do that for families. Um, are you going to pursue an independent autopsy? That was the, before we even got a lawyer, we called the initiative, autopsy initiative, and we are definitely going to have an independent autopsy. I, that is like, you know, honestly number one that I tell families when they're in this situation, get an independent autopsy. So, um, you know, before I was here with you, I was connecting with my family and we were figuring that out. Why, why is it so important to have your own autopsy? When something really terrible happens, physically or mentally, you go to a doctor. And the doctor gives you a diagnosis. And then you get a second opinion. This is a really serious crisis. I want to know what multiple people think about what happened. Um, that's number one. Number two, uh, the coroner is a part of the state and part of the state apparatus. And I don't know the coroner myself, I don't know the office, but I'd like to have an opinion that's not so closely tied to LAPD. The Anderson estate filed papers to sue the city of Los Angeles for damages, claiming the city, quote, failed to properly train the involved officers who ultimately used, quote, unreasonable deadly force. When we come back, we ask her about claims that she was essentially stealing from BLM and what she thinks of Kanye, Candace Owens, and those White Lives Matter shirts. Welcome back. One of the heaviest accusations against BLM co-founder Patrice Cullors is that she was using the organization's money for her own personal gain, allegedly spending millions of dollars to buy luxury cars, homes, and to pay her family and friends. So is any of that true? <laughs> What started as one protest grew into a massive movement, attracting support from artists, actors, and athletes. Souvenir t-shirts, right? And tens of thousands of everyday people. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! From the East Coast to the West. But after George Floyd's murder, the Black Lives Matter movement really took off, going global and influencing the biggest and most sustained protest movement in U.S. history. In 2020, public approval reached new heights, with 61% saying they viewed the movement favorably. That year, the organization raised a reported $90 million. New released tax filings show exactly how Black Lives Matter spent their donation money. But when BLM got more money, Patrice got more problems. A lot of people associate you with financial mismanagement. And I would love to just address that head on. Yep. In April of 2021, the New York Post reported that Patrice had gone on a, quote, real estate buying binge, buying four homes across the country worth a total of $3.2 million, including a $1.4 million home near Malibu, California. 
A few weeks later, the Daily Caller News Foundation reported Patrice paid a company run by the father of her child almost $150,000 to produce a YouTube live stream event. Raising questions of so-called self-dealing or putting her own financial interests above the organizations. The BLM Foundation backed Patrice, saying she hadn't bought any homes through the organization and that she'd been paid a total of just $120,000 over six years. Still, Patrice stepped down. There's this perception that you were using BLM donations to buy a lot of expensive properties. I'm just going to ask you directly, have you ever used BLM money to buy real estate? No. You know, I grew up mostly poor, so when I first started to have money, I was like, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> Let me hire a financial person to help me think about this. And then the people who helped me the most were black women, and black women said, invest in property. And I was really proud of, you know, my really small homes that I had. I wasn't a landlord. These were homes for my family, you know. But the first home I bought was in 2016. And so even the way the messaging around the media the right-wing media was like, all of a sudden, I just bought a bunch of houses. I was like, boom, boom, boom. It's not true. It was like a slow build. It was not a real estate buying binge. That's what <laughs> no, you're saying? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, it was not a real estate buying binge. But because you're a public figure, a lot of people feel like they can count your money. So what would you say to someone who's saying, well, then where did the money come from for all these homes? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I'll say is that I have a speaking agent. And for those of us who know about the market of speaking, at one point I was, you know, spending most of my time on a Delta airline flight talking around the country about the work of Black Lives Matter. Secondly, I have two books. One of them is a New York Times bestseller. I've done a lot of work inside of Hollywood entertainment. I had an overall deal at Warner Brothers. I'm a professor. <laughs> I started an MFA program at Prescott College in which I directed that program. And I ma manage my money well. Do people want me to li be living in housing projects? Do people want me to not take care of my family? I'm not going to allow for my mom to stay on Section 8 forever when I know I can get her a home and she can live in that home. One of the other things that have, have been said, the criticisms, is that you were using some of the money to enrich family and friends. What's your response to that? If I have been working with someone for almost a decade and then you finally get resources and then you tell those people, never mind, we're going to work with somebody else. That's so disrespectful. It was only um, right to finally be able to pay people for work they had been doing for years. But do you think you were paying them fair wages or absolutely. were you overpaying them? No, I absolutely believe we're paying people fair wages. In fact, especially for uh, production and security, those numbers match for the conditions that we were in. For security specifically, I was experiencing death threats every single day, multiple times a day. So much so that the FBI called me twice to let me know there is real and serious threats against your life. So now I'm telling other people, you may die mm -hmm. to keep me secure. You're going to have to pay the price for that. I think another part of that tension is that a lot of the families, some of the families who have lost loved ones, are saying, well, we're not rich. We didn't get any money from BLM, yet our pain and our loss is what has led to all of these donations to the organization. Greetings. I'm Tori Russell, Ferguson frontline organizer, and on the behalf of many activists in the St. Louis area, I'm joined with Mike Brown Sr., the father of Mike Brown Jr. Today, we hold Black Lives Matter accountable. We're asking that Black Lives Matter leadership funds $20 million for Ferguson organizers. We're not begging for a handout. We're coming for what we deserve. Because you don't see them really out there. You see the chapters doing the work. And, you know, they're the reason why they got all that money. How, how do you address that? You know, the minute those donations came in in 2020, I said, let's put that money right back out the door. And I think it's been wholly underreported that, you know, almost at that point, I don't know what's gone on since, but, you know, $25 million was donated back to communities. So it's also just like truly misinformation that money didn't get, go back out the door because it did. 
I don't want to say that people were perfect. I was not perfect. You know, BLM, the org, was not perfect. But we tried really hard. What are some of the things that you take accountability for? Not slowing down. When you move really quickly, it's hard for tr to have transparency. It's hard to explain things to people. I felt like I had to do everything. And you feel that you were targeted by the right. Yeah. Did you feel protected when that was happening? No. <laughs> I mean, I had security, thank you. But, but not that kind of protection, yes. but, pr but protected. But protected. Did, the, did the village surround you? No, they, they did not surround me. I think the right was successful at, at, at making people distressed me. I felt like tossed aside, you know, and thrown under the bus. And, and it, that was like a very painful experience. Do you think that you were made into a scapegoat? Yes. <laughs> yes, I was made into a scapegoat for sure. Patrice, this has been a really difficult few years for you. <laughs> to say the least. Um, you know, a few years ago, you sought treatment for PTSD yeah. after leaving BLM. Yeah. Why? Why did you seek that treatment? When right-wing media and everything happened around BLM happened to me specifically when I was a target and was receiving a lot of death threats. I was in a really, really, really bad place. Y'all, I really need my family to be safe. I need to be safe. I need my child to be safe. You have said that you thought you were going to die, either by someone else's hand or maybe by your own. Yeah, yeah, it was, um, it was a scary time. Is there anything you would have done differently? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> You don't know a thing until you know a thing, you know? Uh, I didn't think in 2013 when I hashtag Black Lives Matter it would become a viral hashtag and then a global movement. But one thing I'll say, and this is, you know, to, to the Patrice two years ago, but also to all the young black organizers who will end up in a situation like me, slow down, take your time. This fight we're in, is a very long fight. It's taken 500 years for this place to build what it's built. It's gonna take that much more time or more to rebuild it, to build a world where black people actually matter. What did you think when you saw Kanye West wearing the White Lives Matter shirt? I thought it was really dangerous for a number of reasons. It gave a lot of space for the right and other people who've used White Lives Matter um, to discredit the work of the movement. We all have our own various like sort of experiences with the you know, last few years of Kanye and I was still like rooting for him. You know, he's been open about his bipolar disorder. I'm a big advocate of mental health. But I think that moment, I really was like, oh, you're not really caring about your impact. Like you don't, you're not, taking to account your actual impact on other human beings. I'll never throw Kanye, the human being, away, but the celebrity, um, I'm good on. And he was joined by Candace Owens, who he's often joined by, and she has shown up at your house to try to question you personally. I was just looking to speak to whoever is at this property because it's listed as the Black Lives Matter property. What do you make of Candace Owens' work? She's a actor in a, a larger, conversation around discrediting the work of black movement. She's really a pawn and it's deeply unfortunate. Do you think she's a willing pawn or do you think she believes in what she's... I can't tell. I feel like that's also one of those things in like 15 years, you know? You think about like Judas and the Black Messiah and like different people who play, different black people who played such a different, you know, that played the role of like trying to ensure that black activism didn't continue. I can't tell if this is like something that she really believes in or something that she like has found her niche and so she's gonna make the money off of it. I can't tell what's going on with her. We were talking about your tattoo <laughs> before we started. Tell me about your tattoo. In many cultures, women get this tattoo when they've, when they've overcome a really um, scary or triumphant time. But it's a sign of victory. It's a marker of having overcome. Yes. Is that where you feel you are now, on the other side? I feel like I've survived a lot. But, you know, I'm too tied to black people to want to say that I've overcome. 
I, I don't feel like I'll ever overcome anything entirely until all black people have overcome racism and patriarchy and things like that. And so it feels too individualistic to say I've overcome, um, but I have survived. And I, my plan and my hope is to not just survive, but to thrive. After the break, more on Patrice's late cousin. He's one of three men who died at the hands of the LAPD within three days of the new year. Is Los Angeles nearing another boiling point? That's coming up next. Mr. Smith, come on. You, I'm, I've been talking with you this whole time, okay? And, and so leave me alone then. Okay, but I gotta talk to you outside. Yeah, touch this up, man. Hey, knife, knife, knife. Hey, I will tase you. Put the knife down or I tase you, understand? Put it down. Less than two minutes later, Takar Smith was shot and killed by the LAPD. And even though Smith's wife told 911 dispatchers that he was in the middle of a mental health crisis, none of the six responding officers called for the specialized mental health team to assist them. Smith is just one of three men in apparent mental distress who died after interacting with the LAPD in just the first three days of 2023. You know, Oscar, something. Hey, Oscar. put that down. Put that down. Put that down. Six bullets were fired at 35-year-old Oscar Sanchez after police felt threatened by a makeshift spear he was holding. It was made from the stem of a scooter with a three-inch spike on the end. The Sanchez family says he was experiencing significant mental health issues. On January 11th, the day all three LAPD videos were released, Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass issued a statement saying that the need for urgent change is clear. Quote, especially as a former healthcare professional, I am deeply troubled that mental health experts were not called in, even when there was a documented history of past mental health crisis. Your cousin is the third person in three weeks to have died after an encounter with LAPD officers. Yes. Now you've said that you don't know if he had a history of mental illness. The other two men who died after these encounters did have a history yes. of mental illness. What do you think the response should be from police when they find themselves interacting with someone who may be in the midst of a mental health crisis? Oh, I don't think the police should be interacting with people with mental health crisis. Um, and this is work that I've been doing long before my cousin was a victim of police violence. Um, my brother has severe mental illness. He's had it severe mental illness for almost two decades now. And I've witnessed the police response being um, negligent at best, abusive and humiliating at worst. And, and so there are resources that we need to provide. Uh, Mayor Bass has said it herself that we need to provide resources to people, you know, uh, mental health care workers to be the first responders to people in a mental health crisis. There are people who are trained to de-escalate. There are people who are trained to um, help people when they're in crisis. I have done it for almost two decades with my own sibling. I've never had to use weapons. I've never had to use force to get him to listen to me, to get him to calm down, to get him to get in a car with me, to go to the hospital. And so the fact that law enforcement comes with guns and tasers and yelling and screaming only escalates the situation. In a lot of situations, officers can be very aggressive, right? They can be using aggressive language. They can be yelling. Turn over on your stomach right now. Turn over. Yes. What should the response be? When someone is going through a mental health crisis, you should never do any of those things. You should be talking slowly. You should be using a very calm tone. Licensed clinical social worker Marvin Tolliver says even the mere presence of uniformed officers can escalate an encounter. Someone calls 911, police show up on the scene, and they find that they're dealing with someone who, who appears to be in the midst of a mental health crisis. What should happen next? Right, so I think police should stay in their cars and call the appropriate mental health crisis response team. They should be assessing the situation first before drawing guns, before drawing tasers, because as we know, when we see a gun or a taser, we're automatically gonna get heightened. Training has to go beyond just what you learned in the 40-hour classroom. It has to be what's in your heart. We only want law enforcement involved 
if there is an imminent threat of danger. Kevin Fisher, executive director of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, found purpose from his own personal tragedy. So how did you get involved in this work? Uh, Unfortunately, the hard way. In 2007, my oldest son, Dominique, to our surprise, was diagnosed with serious mental illness. Uh, He was diagnosed bipolar and schizophrenic when he was 20 years old in a sophomore college. Unfortunately, on June 27th of 2010, we lost him to suicide. Fisher believes the stigma surrounding mental health keeps people from seeking help and suggests NAMI.org as a resource instead of law enforcement. Once you call 911, you are inviting an armed response to your home. So the best way to keep them out of your house and out of your, uh, away from your loved ones is to act and get them treatment prior to becoming crisis. What do you make of the fact that even in cases where Black people are not suspected of committing a crime, it could still result in their death? We truly need to reevaluate police officers at traffic stops. It has never ended well for Black people when stopped by a police at a traffic stop. Traffic stops are these forced encounters where otherwise we may not have encounters with police. That's correct, especially on the West Coast. I think about my early memories as a child driving in a car with my family and cops being behind us and my mom being like, be still, don't look back. The police are behind us, you know? We don't want them to pull us over. Like already instilling that fear because it's, it's a real fear of being stopped by a cop and what may happen. I think about Philando Castile being stopped at a traffic stop. Don't pull it out. and carrying a weapon that was licensed and saying he did all the right things. He did everything right. He did all the right things and was murdered in front of his partner and his partner's daughter. All I heard my son say was, what did I do? It was an unadulterated, unabashed, nonstop beating (laughs) of this young boy for three minutes. Oh my God. Grief-stricken and appalled, the mother of Tyree Nichols was inconsolable after the family was shown police video of the Memphis traffic stop that left her 29-year-old son dead. On January 7th, Tyree was pulled over for reckless driving, and after a vicious confrontation by law enforcement, Tyree died from his injuries three days later. The five cops on the scene have been fired, and the family is suing the Memphis police. Where's the humanity in all of this? You just beat him like a dog in the street. The officers were fired within two weeks of the incident. Now, the speed of that dismissal suggests that the video must be incredibly damning. When we come back, Patrice shares the one thing she would have done differently during her time at BLM. More when we come back. Welcome back as we investigate Black Lives Matter, the true color story. So where does BLM go from here? How does the organization move forward? What do they need to do differently? And what can Gen Z activists learn from Patrice and all those who came before them? 26 BLM chapters sue the organization and its leaders, accusing them of defrauding local activist groups and stealing more than $10 million in donations. I was the founder of Black Lives Matter in St. Paul. I believe the organization stood for exactly what the name implies. Black lives do matter. However, after a year on the inside, I learned they had little concern for rebuilding black families. There's a little bit of turmoil right now. You know, the public support and approval of BLM had reached a very high point after the death of George Floyd. That has now dropped. There are questions about leadership. There are questions about the type of leadership. Is it going to continue to try to be the flat organization? Is it going to shift to a hierarchical model? What do you think the future of BLM should look like? Especially in so far as it pertains to, to Gen Z. It's a really good question. I'm thinking about this a lot. I think that part of the problem is that We, millennials, weren't trained to run institutions. The Panther Party and SCLC, all those were institutions. 
But we're in a different economy. We're in a different world. And I wish someone would have sat with me and said, hold on, this is how you run a nonprofit. It's very different than being a leader of a movement. They're actually different hats and different roles. And my suggestion, especially for the next generation, who wants to be at the helm of the, the next civil rights institutions or abolitionist institutions, is to take a moment and actually get support around how do you run a business. That's what nonprofits are. They're not-for-profit businesses. BLM learned the hard way, pretty much making it up as they went along. Check out their different organizations. There's the BLM Global Network Foundation, the nonprofit business. The BLM PAC, their political arm. BLM Grassroots, the network of local chapters. And then lots of small BLM groups nationwide that are not officially affiliated in any way. Confused? You're not the only one. In 2020, Apple, Google, and Microsoft raised more than $4 million for the Black Lives Matter Foundation, the wrong organization, not connected to the social justice movement in any way. This type of confusion has inspired young activists like Jacqueline Azah to choose the route of grassroots organizing. During the George Floyd protests in 2020, Jacqueline organized a protest of nearly 20,000 participants and raised $6,000 for the George Floyd Memorial Fund. I think people underestimate the power in grassroots. Grassroots organizing is so powerful. It, it not only is it enriching for the activists own self-development, but the transparency in grassroots organizing, um, people were donating. And I think where people get a little weary about the larger organizations is where the money, one, is actually going, and two, the impact it's having in society. And when you talk about those perceptions, transparency, trusting where the money is going, do you feel like there was enough transparency from BLM? Did you feel like at that time it was an organization you trusted or you would have trusted to partner with? The BLM movement and the organization are two separate entities. And I, I spent a lot of time talking about how powerful the movement was and how much I give them their flowers for that movement. They definitely did their thing with that. And I appreciate the owners for giving us that movement. When it comes to them as an organization, I think where they went wrong or maybe they didn't have the resources. I think they got so big that they didn't know how to handle um, an organization with the transparency and things that go into assuring that the people that you're serving feel like you're serving them. And it's interesting because you you speak about BLM in past tense. So when we're talking about the future, where, where do you think the future of BLM is headed? As a young activist, you are the future of activism. So where do you think BLM fits into that picture? I still feel like there is a chance and there are opportunities for BLM as an organization to reemerge in the space as a very powerful leader. I think as Americans and in cancel culture, it's a very big thing to be like, one and done, you're done. Like you made, you made a mistake. But I think if they were to come out and you know talk to the people and be transparent about where they went wrong and reach out to help for help from the young activists who have a fresher outlook on things, from you know people who did it before, like the NAACP, I think there's still space as an organization to grow. But I think the movement that they created has taken on a life of its own. But do you think that young activists like yourself trust BLM, the organization? No. Would you like to see more transparency and accountability from BLM? That's what a lot of people have been calling for. Black organizations are often distrusted with money. That's like actually racism. So that's really important for people to understand. Like, if we remember in 2016, when ACLU raised all that money, nobody ever batted an eye because it's a lot of white people running an organization and people inherently, unfortunately, trust white people with money. They don't trust black people. So I don't want to get caught up in this, like, should there be more transparency? I actually think BLM has been incredibly transparent once it was asked to be, but it wasn't enough. And so it's more of a question of, like, what is needed for us to trust black people with money and finances? What's actually needed? What, what is the culture shift that has to happen? Because that to me is 
like an important conversation that I'd be more than willing to have. As for Patrice's personal future, she said she wants to focus more on projects related to black joy, like her art. She'll also continue working with her family to get justice for Keenan. Coming up, a preview of next week's show, including the uncomfortable and controversial issues surrounding black women and their escalating weight. That's coming up next. Also, it's very different being with black people and having this conversation. It's much more emotional. I'm like, why am I crying so yeah, much? Yeah, it's a complete, there's, there's, there's safety. There's some safety there. Yeah, so thank you. Of um, course. I well, know we, this well, is we like, want to be a safe place for you to have this conversation. Thank you. Welcome back, and thank you for joining us for this special conversation. And thank you, Patrice, for sharing your truth with us. On the next Revolt Black News Weekly, Black Women and America's Obesity Epidemic. Is the body positivity movement having a negative effect? Then, remember the Karens? Whatever happened to all those women caught on camera harassing black people and sparking social media outrage? Well, we'll find out on the next Revolt Black News Weekly. Remember, stay connected with us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Revolt on YouTube, and the Revolt Black News podcast. And don't forget to download the Revolt app. I am Mara Escampo, and we'll see you next time.